Blessed be the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth, and may our lips pour forth his praise. For God is king of all the earth, and God reigns over all the nations. He is highly exalted and worthy to be praised. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to church. I'm so glad that you could make it here this morning. And for those that are online, welcome as well. Um, it's our first snow of the year, so that's exciting um, if you're a kid. Um, <laughs> I still have a little bit of child in me, so, you know, there's a realistic part where I was like, oh, I got to get up 10 minutes earlier, clean off the driveway, do a bunch of stuff. But then there's also another part of me that thought, sledding. <laughs> that's fun. So um, today it is my privilege to introduce to you for the first time our youth band, who is also known in the summer as our camp band. So um, I just wanted to give everyone a little introduction. So we have Catherine on the keys. We've got Tessa and Kiera on vocals. We've got Maeve on bass, Marin on guitar, and then Zach and Lana, who are the ministry di directors at Arlington and our dear friends, and my youth leaders on guitar and vocals as well. <laughs> Guys, we are so excited to worship with you this morning, so thank you for leading us. Very welcome. Um, rise if you're able. We're going to sing Come Now is the Time to Worship. Today, and I'm honored to lead with these young ladies and Zach. <laughs> um, we are the Arlington Beach Camp Band, and um, they, by popular request, we're going to sing one of our camp songs. So, if you um, follow our young leaders here, they have a few actions to teach you.
like this is your, you know, like your campers here. So thanks for joining us this morning. <laughs>
may be seated. Can we thank these guys? Well, let's continue to worship as we pray together. Father, what a delight it is to be together, even on this snowy day. We thank you uh, for the change of seasons and all that they give us and represent. Um, not necessarily all the shoveling and slushy driving, but, you know, the larger principle is there. We're grateful for the moisture. Lord, as we gather together in your name as this body, we pray that you would draw us together and that you would unite us, that you would make us one, particularly those who are at home and can't be here. We pray, Lord, that you would make us ready to worship. We thank you for the way that we have been uh, ushered in this morning, and we pray that you would continue to do that work in us, even as we offer this back to you in recognition that you are good and worthy of all praise. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Lord, as we prepare to give of our tithes and our offerings, we pray that you would work in us and make us cheerful givers, again, recognizing that there are um, things in our world, messages that, especially around money, that can make us feel frightened and insecure. And so in faith, we give back to you a portion of what you have entrusted to us. And we bless you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite Pastor Natasha to come and talk about what's happening in the life of our church. Good morning, everyone. I have a few props with me this morning. I know you love it when I do that. My first announcement is about the board. So we're gonna put the board up, pictures of the board, I think. Anyway, someone asked me, a very neat person asked me, Pastor Natasha, what is the board? Is it a board that we stand on? So I brought a board. <laughs> no, it is not a board that we stand on. But we do call it the board. It is a group of people that make important decisions for the church. And every once in a while, these people um, have had their time um, come up on the board, and so it's time to put their names forward for um, going on the board. And so the congregation has a responsibility to look around them, to pray, say, oh, that person might be an important person to have on the board. Then this person said, is it boring on the board? <laughs> and I said, well, maybe you could ask some of these board members here if it's boring on the board. And then this person said, I would love to be on the board someday. I would make sure that no one is bored on the board. <laughs> If you are new to Northview, we want to welcome you and help you get connected into the community. So we're having a welcome event on the evening of Thursday, October 27th. That's coming up from 7 to 8.30. Also this week on Saturday, October 29th, there's a ladies spa day. How come I can see it here but not up there? Anyway, we are planning to drive to Moose Jaw and have lunch at Deja Vu Cafe and then have a relaxing swim at the Temple Gardens Mineral Spa. I'm sure, guys, there will be something special for you too down the road, but this will be a wonderful time for connection, relaxation together as ladies at Northview. There's a sign-up sheet in the back so we know how many ladies to expect for lunch. Every year, Northview does a Halloween warming center. 
to provide a warm and safe place for our neighbors to come. We are looking for donations of candy, chips, and chocolate bars to hand out um, uh, treats that night. And Lloyd, Lloyd, put your hand up over there. He is also looking for three or four people who would like to help him host this event. I might even let you wear these. So, thank you. And now, Northview kids can be dismissed. This morning I'll be reading to you from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is the word of God. Sarah felt like the uh, scripture passage was too short this week. But I'll just make up for that in words. <laughs> it's no problem. <laughs> So, a number of years ago, I had my first set of interviews with the Free Methodist Church in Canada, and uh, the conclusion that they said to me was, at the end of the first set of interviews, more than half the committee found me to be arrogant and aggressive. And so, <laughs> I was waiting for more gasps. Of shock, what? <laughs> How could they have found that? <laughs> but you've disappointed me. Um, <laughs> so they put me on hold for a year while I did some important work. Uh, one of the things that I did was I contacted uh, my classmates. I had done um, uh, a Master's of Divinity in a cohort setting. So I had been working with the same group of people for three years and thought that they uh, might have gotten to know me and might have some insight because uh, hearing that sort of thing about yourself is fine. Um, and they weren't wrong. It wasn't the first time that I'd heard that kind of thing about myself, but I could never really understand it because I don't have a view of myself, right? I'm, I'm the insider. You guys know me in ways that I don't know myself as outsiders. And so there's certain things about ourselves that we can't see. And so I turned to some people that I thought they know me well. They're safe people. They love me. And they can give me some feedback about what might have been seen and how that might be addressed. So a friend of mine, Linda, from the program, uh, she starts off her three-page letter... <laughs> She says, okay, Dave, you asked for it. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but she was super helpful. I'm not going to read you the whole letter, but she kind of gets to the heart of things when she says, okay, sometimes you throw out your opinion like it is a finished product, like this is the only possible answer, like you are throwing down the gauntlet but not in eager anticipation of someone taking up the challenge, but rather with the arrogant disdain that any peon would dare to challenge you. Sigh. I don't actually think that you think this way, not after knowing you and knowing your heart, but your body language has this arrogance to it. Sometimes I think you are surprised that you think you are starting a dialogue in class, but then one of our classmates is the only one that takes you up on it. Hmm, how to do, to, sorry, how to describe this? A cocked eyebrow, a thrust forward chest, a jutting jaw that defies interaction. 
that arrogant CEO businessman posture of leaning back with arms spread wide on the back of a chair expansively as if opening your torso to attack, but in actuality defying someone to take a shot. I need movie examples here, but I'm drawing a blank. Sorry, my friend. She goes on in that vein for a couple of pages. <laughs> She's really a friend. <laughs> and then she finishes with this. She says, question, are you a visual learner? Maybe you need to pick some role models, even movies, where the guy is strong but not arrogant. Have Sarah help you pick a good one. And then imitate that. Because you are good at imitating, and let's face it, you are good at Jack Nicholson's, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> but maybe you need to work on imitating someone else. Because to be honest, I don't think this is a heart issue. Unless, of course, God is showing you this, in which case, listen to him. But rather, just some old body language habits. Ah, thank you, Linda. We've been talking about worship. We started last week and we're continuing on this week. And I just want to remind you kind of the heart of what I said last week about what this is all about when we talk about worship. This is about our relationship between God and humanity. Clank. So again, remember I used the language of covenant. God has created or established a covenant as he does this creative act of making creation, making something other than himself. He doesn't just do that cold. He does that for a purpose because he wants his love to overflow to something that is other than himself. He wants to be loved and to be loving. And so... This is, of course, a two-way relationship because that's what defines a relationship. Um, and so his direction is the life giving to us, his life extended to us that we participate in. And then our participation is living in obedience or living with the grain of that life. That is worship. At the heart, that's what it's all about. Remember last week when we did Israel's the Shema? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall worship the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, soul. Well, of course, we know that there's a problem historically, that there are issues in this relationship, right? Humanity has actually distrusted God. So the invitation is there, but right at the very beginning of the story, we have that serpent that enters into the garden and actually denies what God says. You will not surely die if you eat of that fruit. And the human couple, looking at the fruit, seeing that it was good and good for food, takes it and eats it. And in that moment, this is their disobedience. They're deciding for themselves that they cannot trust God, that they, in fact, need to take God's place and determine for themselves what is good, and they take of that fruit. And so there's this rejection. Well, the Apostle Paul picks that up in the beginning of Romans when he describes the human situation, both Gentiles, the nations, as well as Israel in the same camp. The end of the day, or the summary is, that humanity generally has distrusted and rejected God, replacing him with idols that we can control, that we can make demands of, and get a response from. And Paul goes on to say it's because of this wholesale rejection of humanity, of God, humanity of God, is that humanity is deserving of death. So again, this isn't God has set some arbitrary rules. I sure can.
and I can't wave both my arms around now, but yeah. Do you need me to start from the top? Oh, did you hear the groan? <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> you guys are fired. <laughs> we are looking for a whole new media team. So. <laughs> okay, where'd I finish? <laughs> what I say? All right. Uh, so, uh, humanity deserving of death, not because God has set some arbitrary rules that we didn't um, meet up with, but because we are trying to live apart from God's life. That equals death. That is death. Right? The, the, at the heart of the lie of Satan is that we can have life apart from God. It's an absurdity because God is the source of our life. And so, we deserve death, but God does not give up on his creation. God is determined to give life to his good creation. And so, through scripture, we see this process of God calling a people, Israel, and then we see the process that Israel shares in the flesh of Adam, the same problems as Adam. And so Israel's mission is um, down to Jesus, the Messiah, humanity's representative. And it's through Jesus, his cross and his resurrection, that redemption has been obtained and is now moved out to all people everywhere. That just kind of catches us up where we are in Romans when we get to Romans 12 and we have Paul's um, description of what we are to do now. And I want you to notice that when it comes to this topic of worship, what Paul is calling on us to be and to do is to become a different type of person. In other words, this change isn't superficial. You've heard me talk about first order and second order change. First order change is that superficial change, right? If you're watching a basketball game and one player leaves and another player comes on and takes the ball and puts it in the hoop, you're watching the same game. Only something within that game has changed. It's just a variable, superficial change. But if you're watching the basketball game and suddenly a hockey player comes skating out and slaps the puck into the net, that is a second order change. You're no longer watching basketball, you're now watching hockey. That is a much deeper, fundamental, game-changing kind of change. And so that's what we're talking about. We're not looking for superficial things, we're looking for this deep DNA heart change. So this isn't about becoming more religious, adding a few more prayers, reading a little bit more scripture, uh, things like that. We are talking about this giving up of self. And so that's why the Apostle Paul starts out by saying, make yourself a living sacrifice. In other words, crawl on up onto the altar. You see, Israel was called to offer different sacrifices at different times in order to cover different things, different types of sins, different seasons in their year. And all of that was to maintain this right relationship with God. But we have been called not to offer sacrifices because Jesus is our sacrifice. There's nothing that we can add to that. Instead, being found in Christ Jesus, we are called to share in his sacrifice. Not through our actual death, but through our actual life. Living as if the old was dead and the new has come. So I want to do this exercise. The Apostle Paul, in the beginning of Romans, introduces himself because this is not his congregation of churches. And so he starts off his letter and he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. So, 
as we begin to think about this transformation, this different type of person, Paul doesn't do just uh, adding a new religious element. Everything in the past is now gone, and he has been established as a new person. That's our same boat. So I want to invite you to say this very same thing about yourself as an exercise. Put in your name. So I would say, David, a servant. Um, the actual word there is far more towards slave. Uh, and Paul does talk that way about himself. We were once slave to sins. Now we're slave to Christ Jesus. So if you're very brave, you can use the word slave rather than a servant. So your name, David, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be a pastor. You just talk about what you have called to be, whether that is an accountant or um, a stay-at-home dad or whatever it is, um, and then finish off with set apart for the gospel of God. Okay, one, two, three, go. Perfect. And now you have been transformed and you will never struggle with these things again. <laughs> it is that view of self that Paul is calling us to be and to do when he calls us to make of ourselves living sacrifices. This is the kind of worship and worshiper that God is looking for. But how do we do that? It's fine to, to do this exercise, and I would encourage you to do that in an ongoing manner, to keep coming back to that, because I think it is actually helpful to see yourself through that lens. But Paul doesn't just stop there. He goes on to give us some more direction about how we would go about doing this. And he starts off by saying, the first thing you need to do is take up your full-time job of saying no to the world's narrative. No longer be squeezed into the world's mold. And here I think uh, I want to talk about worldview and worldview questions. So, Worldview questions help us to get at the larger cultural narrative that all of us live within. The answers that the culture gives to us and therefore forms and shapes us to be, to answer those things for ourselves. So there's four questions that get answered by any narrative. Who are you? Where are you? What's wrong? And what's the solution? So let me illustrate it this way. Some of what was going on uh, at that first interview comes out of my childhood, comes out of who I was growing up as a boy, and the messages, the narratives that I received. So who am I? I was a very trusting and loving boy. I liked people. I was very friendly. Um, in the world that I lived in, I was probably overly friendly. Uh, I would move into potentially dangerous situations. And that leads us into where was I? Well, I lived in a hard and hostile place. People were not safe. Um, you don't want to leave your kids just roaming around, especially not the really friendly ones. And what was wrong? Well, uh, I was weak. That's how I came to perceive myself. That's what being trusting and loving was in the world that I lived in. That was the narrative. I was weak. And the weakness of my nature made me a target and a potential victim. And I recognized the danger that I was in. So what was the solution for me was to get hard, to bury that little boy who was soft and loving and friendly and um, 
begin to become a reflection of my environment, to be able to hit back, to be tough. And so when Linda describes me as throwing down gauntlets and puffing out chest and, and cocking an eyebrow and jutting out a chin, and I imitated the environment that I was in because that's how I needed to survive. That was me allowing the world to squeeze me into its mold. I'm not alone. Each and every one of us have gone through a process like that. The world answers these questions for us. It conforms us and, and molds us and pushes us to answer it in a certain way. Paul recognizes that in his culture that that's true. There are tons of narratives all the time. We are bombarded. Every time we watch a commercial, driving down the road on the way to church, on the radio, on TV, on social media, through talking with friends, through just general conversation, we are always being pushed and shaped and squeezed into the world's mold. Paul says we need to be aware of that and we need to say no to that process of being squeezed because that needs to be escaped as much as I needed to escape in order to become who I needed to become to be a good pastor. And this is why the gospel is such great news. This is why Paul says now at the end of his theological discourse about Jesus, why he could call for us all to become living sacrifices. Because the cross reveals the lie that the culture tells us. That God is not trustworthy. That he does not want good things for us. The cross is that place in history nailed into the ground that marks out forever that God loves us. And he gives everything to demonstrate that right at the very moment that we declare to him, we hate you. When we nail Jesus to the cross, that is humanity's ultimate rejection of God. And it's at that very moment that God's love for us is expressed most fully. The same place. And so it's this alternative story. And that's the next thing that Paul moves into is not only say no to the world's narrative and not be squeezed into that mold, but be transformed through the renewal of your mind. Now, I use this example a lot, and I always preface it this way. I don't know if this is true. I may be telling you something that is completely false, but it works as an illustration, so I'm going to say it. But if you contact the FBI and they tell you something differently, I was up front with you, okay? So I, I swear I heard as a kid a sermon illustration that when the FBI trained their agents to detect counterfeit money, what they do is they have their agents handle real money for weeks on end, just handling it, moving it, piling it, touching it. And after a couple of weeks of this handling, constant handling of the real money, they'll slip in a counterfeit and boom, the agent is able to recognize the counterfeit immediately. Through, not through a thought out process, but because they are just so familiar with the real thing that they can detect the counterfeit. That is what Paul is calling us to do in this renewal of our mind. You see, the world is our source, right? When we reject God, the world becomes our source, and it is always handing us its narratives. This is who you are. This is what it's about. This is what you need to do and to be in order to survive, in order to have the good life. This is what you've got to do. Now, in Christ Jesus, we have this new source, this alternative narrative that actually sets us free, actually will give us the life that the world wants to promise us but can't deliver on. The true narrative. And so 
just like those FBI agents, we need to always be in this story. We need to be going through this story again and again and again and again. We need to keep coming back to it and coming back to it again because we are bombarded. We have to figure out ways in order to make this story that is at the very heart and the center of history and is the most real, most true thing about us, our new story. And it has to outweigh the stories that you're going to see on your way home today, that you're going to see on your television screens today, that you're going to hear from neighbors today, that is in the very atmosphere that we walk around every moment of every day. It has to outweigh it. And so we have to keep coming back to it. Everything in our lives, every single thing in our lives has to be looked at through that lens, through that light of that big story. And we have to do that because we are living sacrifices. If we were dead, it would be easier. But as living sacrifices, we have this awful habit of we keep crawling off the altar. And so part of the process that Paul is calling us to is to just keep getting back onto the altar and laying down. And when we give up ourselves, when we give up these false narratives that the world wants to offer us, and when we give up the promises that the world extends to us, well, then we are able to actually worship God in obedience to live with the flow of his life that he's giving to us. And again, just like it's not arbitrary rules, I don't want you to hear that this is about cold duty. Just, this is right, this is wrong, and you just got to do it. No, it's, I want you to hear that only through obedience, only by conforming ourselves to the narrative of Christ, are we actually able to have this thing that we're longing for, the reason why we bought the lie in the first place, to have life and to enjoy it. To commit ourselves to Christ and to be conformed to this good news is to live for the first time and enjoy life. So much of our worship, our obedience, is thinking that God is just restricting us, is keeping us away from things that are good and that we are going to enjoy. But again, that is the culture and the lie at the heart of it. As a matter of fact, it's when we give up those lies, when we worship God in obedience, that we begin to have the good life for the first time and to discover that we were just playing in ashes before. Well, as I struggled with being a person who is arrogant and can be aggressive, I should introduce you to my family sometimes. We are aggressive. It was helpful. Linda's advice was helpful. I began that summer um, spending some time with some of my brothers and my dad and watching them and listening to them just in their casual getting together, and I realized I had been squeezed into a mold that I needed to say no to, and I started to look for some new heroes, some new mentors, people like Henry Nouwen, who was a Roman Catholic priest who gave up some of the, the things that I wanted at the time to be a Yale University professor in order to work with the severely handicapped. He gave up prestige and position just so gentle in the way that he speaks and ministers or ministered, looking for new sources, people to imitate so that I can become a better pastor. Because let's face it, pastoral ministry is not a place for arrogance and aggression. So for us too, I want you, as homework maybe, to think about those worldview questions. What are the narratives that you have bought into? How have they shaped you? How do you begin to say no to them and in their place 
and assert the story about Jesus. That you are, in fact, lovable. God's own child. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the freedom that is ours in Christ Jesus. Thank you that this is not something primarily that we do, but something that you are doing to us. You are transforming us through the renewal of our minds. And largely what we are doing is putting ourselves in your hands, allowing you to do your good work and seeking to conform ourselves to it. Thank you for the freedom that has come to us through Christ Jesus. Thank you for the love that you have given us expressed in the cross, even at that moment of our highest rejection of you. Would you continue to transform us into the image of your son and to make us new? Let this be our good, living, holy, and pleasing sacrifice of worship to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
chose. Um, Matt Renman wrote this song, and his church was going through a time when they were trying to figure out if they consuming worship, what is it all about, and this is one of the first songs they came back together after um, spending time just um, without even music, just a cappella and then prayer and spontaneous worship, so uh, join us in the heart of worship. prayer of response. Uh, Lord, thank you for this Sunday. Um, I thank you for the snow, that it can absorb all the noise and all the dust, and that we get quiet. Um, Lord, I pray that you keep us gentle and set apart from this world, and that we bring you worship, and not let um, Satan tell us lies that we can live apart from you, because apart from you is death and darkness. Um, I thank you uh, for this group of people that could come together and listen to Dave and also sing these songs and um, that you are close to all of us and near. And um, yeah, I thank you for your love and your grace and your patience with us when we think that we can do it on our own. And um, I thank you for being close to the brokenhearted and for loving the sick and the wounded. And um, you're good, and you remind us of that every day. So I thank you for that. Amen. You may be seated. Can we say thank you one more time? Oh, 
And now we know who plays and who sings and who prays, so it's all going to look different from here on out. <laughs> Receive this blessing. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. Share blessing with one another in person and online, and go in peace.